God of light, light of light, true God of true God. We bless you. Object of the Magi's search, subject of an old man's song, fulfillment of the Baptist's preaching. We bless you. Mary's son, Joseph's son, God's only son. We bless you. Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, until her vindication shines out like the dawn, and her salvation like the burning torch. The nations shall see your vindication, and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name, that the mouth of the Lord will give, and you shall be a crown of beauty in the land of the Lord, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate, but you shall be called, my delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your builder marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm for this morning is Psalm 36, verses 5 through 10. We will read it responsively. Your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens, and your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the strong mountains, your justice like the great deep. You save both man and beast, O Lord. How priceless is your love, O God. Your people take refuge under the shadow of your wings. They feast upon the abundance of your house. You give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the well of life, and in your light we see light. Continue your loving kindness to those who know you, and your favor to those who are true of heart. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. 
Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. And when the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. And Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Today we heard one of four stories from the four Gospels of the beginning of Jesus' ministry. They're all different. In Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount is the first episode of his ministry. He teaches the crowds from the mountainside and he seems to be like the prophet Moses, who conveyed the word of the Lord to the people. In Mark, the first thing Jesus does is cast out an unclean spirit, signifying his intention to stand against everything that would keep the children of God from abundant life. In Luke, Jesus preaches in his hometown synagogue, reading from the scrolls of the Hebrew scriptures that are handed to him. And he reads that one has been chosen to he, excuse me, I'm going to miss that, mix that up, to heal and feed and release the captives and bring good news to the poor. Then he tells the assembly that today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. What he means is, folks, I'm the one. And then he ultimately irritates his hometown people so much that they want to throw him off a cliff. In any story, the first action matters because it sets the tone for the whole of the story. As in, this is where the story starts. This is the direction it's going. In the beginning of, the th of these three gospels, we learn what Jesus intends for his ministry. But in the Gospel of John, he attends a wedding with his disciples and makes a lot of wine for the wedding feast. What a difference between the ministry of solemn Jesus in the other three Gospels and the winemaking in the Gospel of John. Sorry, here we go. How much wine did Jesus produce? so much that you can to this day buy a bottle of it in tourist shops near what is thought to be the site of ancient Cana. Okay, that's not really true. They're selling modern day wine and they've named it, not surprisingly, Cana wine. They even sell it inside glass bottles which are inside little terracotta wine casks. 
I wonder if there are a few tourists who are full, fooled, excuse me, and have it shipped home for wedding receptions. It does sound like Jesus' mother Mary was responsible for giving him the push to do something about the embarrassing situation of a wedding feast running out of wine. And it seems that she thereby triggered the beginning of his ministry. But you'll notice that she didn't ask him directly to do anything. She just commented that the host had no more wine. However, she and Jesus and everyone else knew that the host would carry the burden of shame if the wine ran out in a culture based on honor and shame. Well, mothers have a way of saying a little and meaning more. Sometimes it comes with the look. Jesus replied to his mother in a way that sounds downright rude to us. Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. But his choice of these words might not have sounded so rude to the people of that time. Remember that at the crucifixion, he transferred the care and responsibility of his mother to the beloved disciple John, saying, with all respect, woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. So when the servants have refilled the six large 20 or 30 gallon jars with water, and picture that in your mind, and Jesus has turned the water into wine, that's the sign, as Jesus calls it, of Jesus' divinity and power and glory. Other gospels use the term miracle for Jesus' acts that cannot be explained in ordinary ways. John calls these signs. But on that particular day, Jesus' calling was to bring joy to a couple and their families and their guests. There was no need that day for preaching, for admonition, for prophetic challenge, or healing to touch. The need was simply for good wine and plenty of it. There was a need to party. But the sign itself here, the changing of water into wine, is not even the point of the story. The story is not really about scarcity, and for us in these days, it's just an interesting detail to learn about potentially serious shame for the host family. What the Gospels want to tell us, all of them, is who Jesus is and what God's kingdom will be like, and importantly, that we can help bring it into being here and now. Jesus brought goodness and abundance, but he didn't do that work alone. In bringing the best, Jesus asked for the participation of others. He needed the help of the servants with the water and then with the distribution of good wine. He needed the belief and trust of his disciples and their action. All of us are needed to bring the kingdom into being. The wedding at Cana reveals that Je with Jesus, the best is yet to come. When the steward tasted the good wine Jesus provided, he declared, everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. John, in this story, is telling us that the God's kingdom means abundance for us, symbolized by the gallons and gallons of good wine for feasting. And the feast and the joy of this story in John allude to what is often called the heavenly banquet. We hear a description of this heavenly banquet in Isaiah. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, 
of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The abundance of the kingdom foretold in Isaiah means, very simply, abundance of God's love for us and God's joy in our joy. In the beginning of the Gospel of John is written, from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Not just grace and joy, but joy upon joy and grace upon grace. An abundance of grace and abundance of joy. Well, what does grace mean for you and me? What is it like to experience God's grace? That might be a little hard and also a little different for each of us to describe. We can sometimes think of God's grace as gifts, gifts of our daily bread, of family, of health, and so forth. That's not wrong. But thinking of grace as gifts tends to make us think of tangible or recognizable things we receive. I think God's grace may be, additionally, a little more mystical than that. I think that we experience grace in epiphanies, each of us, moments of grace in which we can see, but just barely, that God has done something. Or perhaps in times we can individually or together sense that God is present with us in whatever way we need God's presence. Then that is an epiphany too. God is always present with us and sometimes we can sense it. One of the times I sense God's abundant grace, God's presence, is right here at Trinity during our worship, whether it's virtual or in person. It's better in person, I'd say. Sorry to the folks at home. And we could say, duh, because this is where we are supposed to experience God's presence. But there are special times in our gathering together, maybe at a funeral of a well-loved person from Trinity when grieving together is God's grace. And likewise, there are times when worship is so abundantly joyful that I'm pretty sure all of us are experiencing, experiencing that grace, that lightness of heart, that gladness. And I think our joy together is what makes God joyful. And now I want to close with the first verse of a hymn we're going to sing in a few minutes. And aren't I lucky that this sermon sings together with the hymn. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. And I know that it's the spirit of the Lord. There are sweet expressions on each face. And I know they feel the presence of the Lord. Amen. Standing as you are able, let us recite the words of our faith found in the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. Begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven 
and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. As God's chosen and priestly people, let us pray for the needs of the church and the world, saying, O gracious Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for the people of God, loved wholly by God and sent to be light in the world. O gracious Lord, hear our prayer. For leaders of nations and for those who serve us in governments, that all people may work for peace and justice. O gracious Lord, hear our prayer. For all who are prosecuted, persecuted, shunned, neglected, or rejected because of prejudice, that they may find welcoming love in our community of faith. O gracious Lord, hear our prayer. For all married couples and their families, that they may share the joy and love of God for all. O gracious Lord, hear our prayer. For all members of the church community, including the sick, the dying, the deceased, and those who mourn, especially those affected by the coronavirus, and those listed here that are near to our hearts, and those we now name silently or out loud. O oh, gracious Lord, hear our prayer. <clears throat> For all who protect and serve, as well as their families, the police, the firefighters, emergency medical personnel, and those serving in the military, especially those listed that are near to our hearts, and those we name silently or out loud. O oh, gracious Lord, hear our prayer. For those in our parish family celebrating anniversaries this week, John and Millie Kovaleski, O oh, gracious Lord, hear our prayer. For all members of our community, that we may recognize the gifts we have received from the Spirit and use them freely for the good of all. O gracious Lord, hear our prayer. For the saints who have gone before us in the faith and are now at rest, especially for John Shake, Shank and Grant Combs Jr. for whom the altar flowers are given, and for all the saints on earth who surround us in a great fellowship of love, O gracious Lord, hear our prayer. Holy God, lover of the human family and helper of all in need. Hear the prayers we offer in faith and strengthen us in your love. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins to God. God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your goodness in each other, in ourselves and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us, through Jesus Christ, that we may abide in your love and serve only your will. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. I think we'll stay where we are for the peace again. <laughs> Right. It's an invigorating cold out there today, isn't it? <laughs> Didn't notice. Didn't notice. <laughs> Are there announcements? Yes. I hear a yes. I <laughs> Thank you. 
going with this? Armed forces are, they're, um, they were always supposed to turn in their uniforms at the end of serving in Norwegian armed forces. But I don't think Norway has a very big um, defense budget, shall we say. So now they are being asked to additionally turn in their military underwear. Now, I don't want to be in the Norwegian army and get someone else's military underwear. So bring fresh. And thank you. <laughs> are there other, I'm afraid, are there other announcements? <laughs> Right. So, <laughs> so uh, today, after the service, we have our vestry meeting, uh, I think m mostly via Zoom. Um, if some people want to stay, that's, that's fine, too. <laughs> right. And on Thursday at noon, we continue our healing service via Zoom. And tomorrow is uh, a national holiday, Martin Luther King Jr., so it is, the office will be closed but it is a day set aside for service in honor of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And in honor of that, our closing hymn today will be Lift Every Voice and Sing. I think that's it. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us in offering and sacrifice to God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift up them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. All thanks and praise are yours at all times and in all places, our true and loving God. Through Jesus Christ, your eternal word, the wisdom from on high by whom you created all things. You laid the foundations of the world and enclosed the sea when it burst out from the womb. You brought forth all creatures of the earth and gave breath to humankind. Wondrous are you, holy one of blessing. All you create is a sign of hope for our journey. And so as the morning stars sing your praises, we join the heavenly beings and all creation as we shout with joy.
Glory and honor are yours, creator of all. Your word has never been silent. You called a people to yourself as a light to the nations. You delivered them from bondage and led them to a land of promise. Of your grace, you gave Jesus to be human, to share our life, to proclaim the coming of your holy reign and give himself for us a fragrant offering. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, you have freed us from sin, brought us into your life, reconciled us to you, and restored us to the glory you intend for us. And we thank you that on the night before he died for us, Jesus took bread. When he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his friends, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, said the blessing, gave it to his friends, and said, Drink this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And so remembering all that was done for us, the cross, the tomb, the resurrection and ascension, longing for Christ's coming in glory and presenting to you these gifts your earth has formed and human hands have made, we acclaim you, O Christ. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Christ Jesus, come in glory. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine, that they may be to us the body and blood of your Christ. And grant that we, burning with your Spirit's power, may be a people of hope, justice, and love. Giver of life, draw us together in the body of Christ, and in the fullness of time gather us with blessed Cyril, our patron saint, and all your people into the joy of our true eternal home. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, we worship you, our God and Creator, in voices of unending praise. Blessed are you now and forever. Amen. Now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to sing. Alleluia, be known to us, Lord Jesus, in the breaking of the bread. Be known to us, Lord Jesus, in the breaking of the bread. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God.
Our service continues with the post-communion prayer. Let us pray. Lord of the feast, we thank you for gathering us as your people. We call to remembrance the many times we have been fed at your table, and we lament our distance now. Be present, Lord Jesus, as you were present with your disciples. Be known to us in the breaking of the bread. And may your Holy Spirit sustain us and all your church until we can gather together again. We ask this for the sake of your love. Amen. May God, by the power that turned water into wine at the wedding feast at Cana, transform your lives and make glad your hearts. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Alleluia, alleluia.